people to remember that they barely talk about it even among themselves. Not long afterwards, Dougal Robertson left his wife and children to make a new life of his own. During World War II, more men were left to their fate and the mercy of the sea than at any other time in history. The British Merchant Navy alone lost over 2,600 ships and 32,000 seamen. A further 2,100 cargo vessels belonging to allied and neutral nations were also sunk. Many went down with their ships, but thousands took to lifeboats and rafts or simply floundered in the wreckage. The majority died fairly quickly. The lucky ones were picked up within hours or days. But the worst fate of all was to find oneself adrift on an empty ocean facing a slow, agonizing death from thirst and exposure. Sometimes, ships would come across survival rafts with nothing on board but a scribbled message, or they would find boats manned by a dead crew. What awful privations were suffered will never be known. Occasionally, men did survive for long periods, and amongst all the terrible experiences of those years, one of the most horrifying is that which befell 14 men from the crew of the Lulworth Hill. In March 1943, the Lulworth Hill, an armed merchantman, was ordered to proceed to her home port, not in convoy, but alone from Cape Town. On the evening of the 18th, she was attacked by a U-boat. The torpedoes missed, and the Lulworth Hill broke radio silence to report both the attack and her position. Later that night, she was attacked again. This time, the torpedoes struck home. It blew me right out of my bunk up into the bulkhead, which hurt my arm and my leg. And uh, I managed to get back onto my feet when a second explosion, another torpedo struck us. The only thing I wanted to do was to get out and get to the lifeboats, as I thought. There was no chance of any lifeboats getting launched. The ship was cut in two. Half of it had already sank. And within um, two minutes, the whole ship had sank. So the only thing I could do was to jump over the side. Petty Officer Kenneth Cook was 26 years old and an experienced seaman. As he struggled in the water, he saw a searchlight sweeping the surface of the sea. It was the submarine, but he swam towards it and clambered onto its deck, expecting to be taken prisoner. Instead, he was simply questioned by one of the officers. But meanwhile, seven or eight more survivors had swam and was clinging to this submarine in different parts. And they was questioned, exactly the same as I was questioned, expecting, like myself, to take them board prisoners. But we weren't. He left with us a farewell ma message to this commander of this submarine as a reprisal to the RAF bombing the fatherland, I leave you to drown. If we had to drown then, it would have been much quicker and a much cleaner death that it actually left us to face. The submarine moved off, washing the men back into the sea. He hadn't travelled more than two or three hundred yards, still flashing his searchlight, when I saw, in the light of the searchlight, what seemed to me to be an upturned lifeboat, and on it were some small survivors. Whether intentionally or not, that submarine whether it saw the, 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 the boat or not, it went straight through it, scattering and killing more of the survivors. After that, the light went out, the diesels faded in the distance, and we never saw that submarine again. It now seems likely that the man who had questioned Kenneth Cook was a German liaison officer, because the submarine was in fact Italian. Called the Da Vinci, it continued its patrol into the Indian Ocean and nine weeks later, after having sunk four more ships, 
It was itself destroyed near the Azores whilst heading back to base. I swam until daybreak. The sun was well up when in the distance I saw one of the ship's life rafts. It was a modern life raft, a good life raft as, as it was in those days. Um, and I had a, a very hard battle to swim towards it because I was tired, I was sick with the fuel oil of being swallowing. But eventually managed, it's surprising what you can do when you're fighting for your life. And when I got there, I discovered on board that raft one more survivor who had a hard time in getting me on board. He was sick and, and very weak and ill, but he managed to get me on board and uh, after a while I uh, gathered myself together a bit and we began to search for other survivors. Now you cannot navigate a raft, you've got to go where the elements take you in a raft. So we did our best to keep in the vicinity where the ship had sunk. We could see where it had gone down with all the fuel oil and the debris, quite, quite a lot floating on the sea. And we searched for the survivors and we searched all day. And out of a crew of 47 merchant seamen, we picked up 14, including myself. The survivors included the chief officer, the second engineer, the chief steward, and two apprentice officers. Out of the total of 14 men, eight were aged 19 or under. Basil Scown, the chief officer, was 33 years old and was liked and respected by all the ship's crew. Our chief officer was a, a, a very good officer and he was a navigational officer. He knew where we were, he knew the winds, he knew the currents in that part of the ocean. And he said, I've calculated with luck we should drift to the coast of Liberia in 30 days. Now, nobody thought it was going to be on that raft 30 hours. The raft certainly wasn't provisioned or even made for 14 men to live on for 30 days. Well, the raft was 10 feet long and 8 feet wide on the outside. So with the seat in uh, the wooden planks, uh, when you were sat down, with your feet in the well of the raft, your knees was touching the other survivor's knees in front of you. Your bottom was so close to the sea that the dorsal fins of the sharks was higher out of the water than what your bare flesh was. You wasn't any board, uh, anything at all to lean back on. So you had to sit up straight or lean forward with your knee in between the other survivor in front of you, and then the same was to you interlock your legs. And at night, or at the daytime, if you wanted to nap or sleep at the beginning, you had to put your chin on his shoulder, and he'd put his chin on your shoulder, and you'd lock arms around one another, and that's how you'd get your sleep. And two men were stood to let this happen all the time. And that went on until men Began to die. They had been sunk 250 miles to the east of Ascension Island, but they were drifting helplessly north towards the equator. The daytime temperature was over 100 degrees, they had almost no supplies on board, and there was never any rain. Uh, there were some tins of bovril pemmican that was just like a fish paste, and there was a tiny spoon, there was uh, seven or eight gallons of water, Tiny spoon for the bovril pemmican, which held a third of an ounce, that was uh, your lunchtime meal, and two ounces of water, which was given in a little cup marked in ounces, so nobody got more or less than the share. And this they got uh, two ounces of water three times a day, at sun up, at midday, and when the sun went down. Breakfast time, we got a couple of three all small olic milk tablets. Lunchtime, we got the bubble of pemmican. And at tea time, we get a, a couple of little tiny pieces of chocolate. And that's all we had to eat. Even as the survivors struggled in the water as the ship went down, men had been killed by sharks. Ever since then, the sharks had surrounded the raft and were a constant danger. The sharks were more numerous. They were attacking us. They, they couldn't wait for us to, to die. We could look at them and they were huge, terrible beasts. Uh, some probably 18 
18 feet long, twice the length of the raft nearly. Waiting, waiting, waiting. So th they weren't helping, watching those things. And the old sailors used to say, if a shark follows a ship, somebody's going to die. I got the idea that I'd cut a piece of sailcloth. Uh, it's a little bit of lead pencil that the chief officer had. Then I decided I'd, I'd write uh, what had happened to the ship, the date, the time, and how it was sunk. And then little things from there on, how the men died, whether they died sane or madness or gangrene or from the wounds. And I kept it right up to the, to the, to the end, right in little bits. I could see a, a change for the worse already beginning after 14, 15 days. And I thought that, uh, I began to think that uh, if we're not going to be rescued soon, that we're going to lose some men. There was not only the chief uh, looking poorly, but several of the young boys and the engineer who was very, very badly wounded in his feet. And this awful smell, uh, a lot of the chaps didn't uh, realise at the time what it was, but I knew what it was, it was gangrene. When these huge chunks of rotting flesh used to fall from his feet until he could see the bones moving, and he was still alive. Mazel Scown, the chief officer, was the first to go. He died after 19 days, but before he died, he handed over command of the raft to Kenneth Cook, even though, as a petty officer, Cook was not the most senior man on board. And death eventually paid his first visit to us. It wasn't a very nice death. Uh, Thirteen hours had to sit there and watch him die. Especially the young ones, the effect on this officer's death had a very bad effect on the lives of the young ones, especially the young ones. They seemed to give up hope when our chief went. Well, his body was there. We, we couldn't uh, leave it uh, propped up on the raft as it was. We couldn't move about very well yet. And uh, uh, we wanted to get rid of the body, and uh, our, uh, Mr. Patton, our chief steward, said that, uh, what about it? He said, uh, we better get this body over the side. Oh, I said, no, I said, oh, we can't do that. I said, it's indecent. I said, uh, he hasn't been dead very many minutes, actually. Well, he said, if you don't, he said, you know what, what may happen to that body? Oh. It hit me like a ton of bricks, and I'd never even thought of uh, cannibalism or anything like that at that time. So I said, well, we'll keep his body on the raft until nightfall. The little John's prayed, the sun had gone down. I knew the sight we should see. The sharks were still there, big, great big brutes. Scarface is the biggest one, we, we nicknamed Scarface. Many battles he'd fought, and he hadn't waited for nothing, you see. So, as soon as it was dark, we stripped his <coughs> few clothes off his body and we rolled his body, uh, little John saying a few words of prayer, and uh, the splashing, and we knew what was happening, a stern, a few yards, a few feet off the raft. It didn't last long, the, sh the sea boiled for a few seconds and the body had gone. They didn't last long, uh, one after the other began to die. What could I do? I couldn't just watch them die. We, we couldn't help them to die. We could have helped them to die, certainly, which we did eventually when they really went mad. We couldn't keep them on the raft. Uh, they would have killed somebody else, but it was rational. And so one particular chap who went mad, a great big strong chap, he took two men over the side with him without any warning. He jumped up and over the side with two men. Now, I had to give an order not to bring that back man back on the raft. He was mad. He would have, could have killed somebody else. So we had to leave him. I gave the order. I've had to live with this for the rest of my life. I had to give the order for that man to be left to the shark. It didn't last long. One of the other survivors what went over the side. We got him back on board the raft. The second one was dragging him a try. We couldn't, we weren't very strong. We had a hard time pulling his body onto the raft. A shark came and took his foot off, up to his knee nearly. So that body, or that man, had to be put back, still alive, through my orders, 
back into the ocean, devoured in a few seconds by the sharks. With the passage of time, the pain of hunger disappears, but the agony of thirst can only get worse. And eventually, some of the men started to drink seawater. They just sipped and sipped and sipped until they begin to take a half a, uh, should we say, half a cupful at a time. Until it drove them mad. And mad, really mad, they went. We had to dash them down. Now, another problem was the water. They was trying to get to the water in the hours of darkness. So, one man had to have his hand lashed on top of the little water canister so nobody could open it without us finding, finding out. That's how bad it was. At the beginning, when you could make uh, normally a, a normal function of passing water, but uh, that was wasted for the first few days. But when you really got thirsty and you wanted water, Someone tried to gargle. This is what set us all off. Gargling with your own water. You didn't swallow it. And you spat it out. But it used to refresh in your glands here. Until your water in your body, till your whole body changed. And that, that uh, water changed into acid. Where you could almost extract it by pulling it from your private parts. With your fingers. Now our bodies, they'd changed now. There was thin and gaunt, black, sunburnt, terribly sunburnt. Some of mine was all right because I was an ardent sailor. Been out in the tropics many times. But the young ones, they were the first trippers or second trippers, and they, they wasn't used to this. The bodies just split and opened like pieces of raw butcher's beef. And we couldn't treat them. They are already sore with salt water boils, the chafing of the raft. The hair was now white. Mere skeletons to look at, could hardly speak, some of them could hardly speak. No hope left, giving up hope. And then little John, his time came. He was heard croaking out my name. He couldn't call me name. He was croaking it out, his throat was so parched and his tongue was dry. I crawled over to him because I was in a similar state to little John, probably a little bit stronger. And I crawled over to little John and, and, and cradled him in my arms the best I could, what was left of him. There wasn't a lot to get hold of. And he said that he was going to die. He said, I'm not afraid to die. But he said, I've been talking to God, and some of you will be saved, and you'll be one of them. He then left a personal message uh, for his mother and father with me, which eventually I was able to, to give them. And uh, in a few minutes, he sighed and he died. After John had gone and a couple more had passed away, I'm afraid uh, the few words of prayer that I used to say over the, the, the dead uh, didn't exist anymore. The uh, religious part of it left us. Uh, I used to stare into, into these two eyes that was looking at me. And uh, I could, I got as though I knew that uh, it wouldn't be long before you passed on or you go to go, going to go mad. And the feeling was, I had was, well, you, you die. And I shall have a little bit extra water. And he's looking at me, these two eyes are looking into mine, and he's probably thinking the same. There was no laughing from the day we was torpedoed. There was no jokes. There was no talking of food. There was no talking of having a couple of pints when you got home. That would have caused almost murder. There was no love for each other, as an ordinary person, layman, would imagine that you got a part of one another. It was just the opposite. There came a hatred, where the least little tapping of annoyance used to annoy you. It annoyed me, where a young, a young boy started tapping on the boards of the raft. He was going insane. And I kicked out at him with me, with my foot. I didn't know what I was doing. But I kicked at him. I kicked at him until he was nearly dead. And then when he was dying, he called to me. And I went to him. 
And he said to me, he said, you as the only man on that ship I wanted to emulate. Now, he says, you aren't any better than the others. He died. Now, what effect do you think that had with me? Not a lot, because my mind wouldn't take it at what I'd done. I was getting, I was losing my mind. I was going, uh, losing my senses. By the 30th day, six men had died and several others were barely alive. Conditions were now so desperate that the survivors were willing to try almost anything in order to live. Cannibalism was, wasn't discussed um, by many. It was discussed when there was only four or five of us left at the end. But uh, it, was, it was quite some time before we could uh, even insert the knife that I had into a man's side. It took a lot of doing. A terrible thing to have to do. I don't think there's a lot of men, as, as, as I know anyway, what's uh, eaten human flesh. We wanted to eat it. Obviously, we wanted to eat it. We knew we were dying. We knew we were dying. Uh, what we, we did do, we, we used the blood uh, to... Uh, we used it more as a, a, a saliva on our lips and our tongue to try and give us a little bit of uh, moisture that way. But as I said, as soon as the blood began to trickle from the wound in the man's side into the water and the sharks got it, well, we had to pack it in altogether. It was either that or the sharks would have had us. On the morning of the 35th day, the chief steward died. Now, only two men were left, Colin Armitage and Kenneth Cook. But their suffering was far from over. My fingers was going black, just like twigs, dead twigs on a tree, no blood. And my heart was so weak, and what little bit of blood I had, I was having a very difficult job of pumping it around my body. So one side of my whole body used to go dead from my toes, right up to me, to me, to me ahead. And before I could move my arm or my leg, I had to get me, me, me right hand and move my left hand to work it about to get a little bit alive. Then after a period of time, that side would come alive and then this side would die. That's how close to death we were, but still alive. It is difficult to know what it was that kept these two men going. Their courage and iron determination are almost beyond comprehension. So I was now beginning to crack up. Colin, he was in a bad state, and uh, we were so bad this night that uh, the sea was rough, and it was, we were so miserable and, and near death that we talked that we would, the best thing we could do now, our water supply was down to two ounces a day. And we decided we'd end it. And the best thing we would do, we could do was to get some rope yarn, lash ourselves together, and go roll over to Scarface, the big shark. And what stopped me from doing it was the voice of little John. Came back to me, and he said that some of you are going to be saved. That saved me from going over the side. And I vowed then and then I would stick it to the end, that I would either be rescued or I'd die on the raft. After 45 days, they were spotted by a plane, which dropped them a radio transmitter and a rubber dinghy, but no food or water. Three days later, another plane found them, and two days after that, the destroyer HMS Rapid arrived to pick them up. They were still 400 miles from land, and they had been adrift for just over seven weeks. They found us uh, on the 50th day, noon on the 50th day. What was left of us? We saw the, 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 this destroyer approaching us, and well, one cannot uh, describe your feelings uh, of joy, of happiness, of relief. It all, all was there, and you could hardly swallow as it was, and with all this extra. Uh, 
feelings we got, uh, it almost choked us. That's the only thing I can say about the seeing this. Uh, I remember writing uh, when I was in the sick bay on the on the destroyer, the greatest day of all my life. Colin Armitage married and had three children, but sadly, he died in 1950 at the age of 27. Both men were awarded the George Medal, and the grateful government, which had started to pay Cook's widowed mother a pension for the loss of her son, asked for its money back. For Cook, time alone cannot erase the memory. Still with me now, and it will be until I die. Always we will. It's a part of me. It's something I shall never forget. I don't want to forget it. So I've got to live with it now until I die. <laughs>